thanks for this wonderful introduction, but I won't answer all these questions. I will do something completely different. I'm sorry to disappoint right from the beginning. But anyhow, we start. So I think the most of you here in the room have clinical trial experience. How many of you were already involved in clinical trials? Just raise your hands. Okay, so I don't have to give my talk because you know all about it. <laughs> so that's the easy one. No, well, there are some points. Um, I collected some some ideas and things, so it's it's perhaps not the usual thing you see. I start with something rather easy. So one of the first clinical trials was really on scorbut, and in this description, really taken from Wikipedia, you have all the items you need to understand the clinical trial. So it was James Lind who conducted this on board on a ship because he needs sailors to be on duty, to be fit for duty. So that was really the trial question. Which sailor I can put fit on duty for overnight and for the day? Um, and he already was aware of the trouble because it was the scorbutic uh, problem in those. So he started to point out six different groups and in each group he put two sailors and he also had some idea that the food, the intake of food could be something that is the changer and to put people back on duty. And you see in the six groups there was a group five who received two oranges and one lemon and that was the life changer. The life changer was really those two. Is, is this? I'm not loud enough. I see Randall in the back. Better? Oh, I have to put it in. So, so now it's better. Uh, sorry for this. So, so the, the life changer was definitely the, the two oranges and the one lemon. And uh, of course, here the one sailor was already then fit for duty, and the next came up uh, later on. But you have also a trouble already that is for clinical trials also something we, we face today. They run out of fruit. So the supply issue is already mentioned here, and that's something we also need for, for the clinical trials. The supply. So if we have a new treatment, we want to have enough supply for this to really go for a long-term treatment and to treat a lot of them. So therefore, you see the effects of treatment are related to, of course, a good idea, and then uh, we face the next thing. So in between, we are now have a clear setup of things like that. So clinical trials and drugs are usually described in their faces, and I will go through that. And there's a slight difference between the US and Europe, but I will try to, to bridge them a bit. And to start with something rather easy, so here's all what you need to know just in a nutshell. So clinical trials in a nutshell, first you have to have um, preclinical testing of, of your items uh, yeah, in that direction, I try to, to overcome this. So you have to have an idea, that's first line, and then you start to think how can I put this into a preclinical phase, so how can I start to have lab tests, can I have uh, animals that really um, read my issue and have a research protocol and then you start to use that in a tissue or animal model and later on if you have overcome this step then you start to find the right dosage for the human situation. And the next step is what you need is a proof of concept that really I'm treating the target I'd like to treat. So I treat pompe disease, so therefore I need to have the enzyme. And you have seen the first machine of that. So the Icon Arnold yesterday evening showed this first really biotech machine on his desk. So that was really beautiful to see that Arnold, thanks for that, showing up this, this machine again, because I think that was really the proof of concept. So there is a production line, can rise enzyme, and the enzyme finally helps to overcome the disease. And of course, in a bigger scale, then you have all the issues of, of efficacy and safety. You have to show and to prove that what you are doing is really well done and really saves a lot of life as you have seen in the infant puppet trials, but also later on in the late onset trials. And of course, then you have to do a lot of data analysis, and that's the part normally industry is doing excessively because they want to be sure that all what they did, with all side effects included there, with all compliance issues, and also biotechnology has to help that really there's enough uh, supply what uh, you need for really covering a lot of groups of patients around the world. And then later on, and that's the stage we are facing now for more than 10 years for pompe disease, is the follow-up of patients. 
And of course, that's just a normal, regular thing. Phase one, normally you have healthy uh, population and here you just go for safety and side effects. And then in the next stage, you normally increase up to 300 persons. So that's all you see, not for rare disease, it's for general. But you go up to 300 persons and here you start to have the effectiveness of your drug. That's the next stage. And this lasts normally several years to collect all these data and we are in that very much uh, presently. And finally, the, the most important stage is then the phase three trial, because here you have, of course, again, safety signals, but also you will see in a blinded fashion, so normally you do a randomized control trial here at that level, that your drug is really doing the right thing in the right way. And normally, if it's not a rare disease, you need a lot of people. So I was involved in my first clinical trial now 27 years ago. So I started as a neurologist resident in a stroke trial. And, and at that, so I had to cover uh, my, my first cohort of patients. I was the clinical trial uh, person was 100 persons. So that's completely different to the rare disease where you really know your person very well you are treating. And that as well as a lot of faces and I hardly remember the name the second time. Uh, and that's the difference in those big clinical trials. And of course, then we have a phase four, that's more a safety issue after the FDA or EMA approval. Also here again, it's more on safety signals and if you see long-term side effects in the patients, also this is a very important step. So what is the difference in rare diseases? In different in rare diseases is one thing that happened in 1983, so that was the Orphan Drug Act. So at that uh, time point, normally none of the industry was interested in doing trials in rare disease because it was highly expensive to do that. It was completely unknown what to do there and how to help the patients. And there was no structure, no organization. There was nothing like you here. So there was really just a blank field and therefore, um, a lot of people around the world, and especially the FDA, but also in Europe, a very similar thing, they thought, we have to help that. So if industry is going to start a clinical trial, we gave them at least a 10 year of a safe space for their drug if this is considered to be a treatment drug in the long run. And that helps to attract industry a lot. And very similar, uh, there's an orphan drug uh, page for the EMA. So those are the major organizations. And nowadays we have a lot of them, just have a look at Europe. So presently, so that's from last week, the result gives, if you look for orphan drug destinations in rare diseases, you have 2,200, but if you look closer, you have uh, public assessment reports of 1,300. So that's not that much. So that's really not that much for the, the whole field of rare disease we are covering. Uh, but, but anyhow, it's, it's a good start. So, so there's some very good summary on this. So what is really the, the disease condition? It's a condition affecting less than uh, 200,000 persons in the United States, or normally you say one in 3,000, that's the number you need. And we're facing something about seven to 8,000 different diseases. So if you count all of them, rare diseases in total are not rare. They are very common but all of them are, of course, singular to this, and, and that's one of the differences. And of course, there are many of the, the different types, and I go in not in all details here to this. Um, but one of the troubles, of course, is normally small populations. So we have limited opportunities to learn about what is really the nature of the disease, what is really the natural cause. We learned about this this morning, that even here the experts are still not sure what is your natural cause of the disease, and can we predict individualized patient by patient what is his cause of disease? That's still not doable. So therefore, we have a lot of hurdles here to see. We have a heterogeneity in the collection of the disease. We have then also a poor understood mechanism, but we are in Pompe in a better shape than in many of the others. We know much more, but still we need to address uh, things like the, the cerebral uh, involvement in those patients, what we here face. And we still see that people die earlier. So that's also a fact we have to see. We see it in the infants, but we also see it in the adults. So we have to take care more on these aspects as well. So it's still a severe disease. It's not something that's just doable. And of course, the pediatric population has still a high demand of unmet needs in that. And we have additional trial hurdles. I don't go to that, but that's before you can start to perform a clinical trial. There are a lot of items. 
There are a lot of administrative work to do, and sometimes you think it should be much faster, so why we are so slow? And here you see listed some of the hurdles we, we have to cover and to face for all these different items. So some of them are regulatory parts, but others are really more insurance topics, um, then uh, parts of the project management, manage, management, I come to that a bit later, so what's ongoing there, and there's also additional hurdles, of course, country selections, different regulations in countries, and all that is really one of the big troubles we have for the start. To give you a glimpse on that, so what is the meaning for Pompa disease, I just go to two little examples. The first one is the Neo GAA here in Rare disease, you normally put together phase one and two. And what you are doing here is uh, really designing first a group of patients where you scale up to your highest dose and then, of course, have an open extension study. That's the usual thing what you do. And that's very similar. Also, if you look at them, you look for safety, for the profile of your drug and things like that. And very similar for the amicus trial. It's a very similar thing you do, so therefore just to, to have that. And that's ongoing, and we still are now in both for the extension phase of that. Uh, you will hear the results and more details tomorrow on both drugs. But on top of this, we are for pompous disease in the phase three trial phase for, for Comet, but also for, prom, uh, for Propel, and you see the, the numbers of patients you need are really similar because you do a so-called power calculation that you see how many positive outcomes you need that the drug might be approved for uh, then a finally licensed product. And so there's something about uh, 200 in two cohorts, both are randomized, that's important, they have a parallel assessment, and you see that some of the the difference is, is in the primary outcome and some of the cohort um, uh, the types of people you integrate here and uh, things like that. So, so th there's a, some differences but not extremely um, differences in total and hopefully my hope is both enzymes come alive rather soon. But anyhow, on top of this, what is the really likelihood of a uh, uh, approval rate. So that's something we also have to keep in mind. And here's a very good number, also it's from five years ago, but you see that about a 10% chance for phase one coming into a FDA approval. So therefore you see we are losing 90% of drugs. They are started and they have a rational why they should be in uh, the patient population. Uh, tested and only 10% of these comes alive and I think that's something you have to keep in mind why our rates are perhaps not that positive as we'd like to see that in, in many of the examples. And there's a system and that's also something that's the second stage. So there's a system how can a drug be approved and that's country-wise different. I don't go for, for the, the German and the Canadian situation and you have seen for England, for Italy, all these countries have different boards of regulations you have to run. And if you look here at the US, so that's one of the final slides for this, you see here that there is also a clear system how to get a drug approved and finally uh, you have to run all these different stages. Sometimes you can run over one, but normally you have to do all these stages and that's really what uh, the, the time constraints in many of these issues is really likely high in, in that uh, process. If you want to have more and very solid information, you can go to this page. It's called the NORD page. There you see a lot of summary information on clinical trials and research. And if you want to specifically look for what is ongoing in pompe disease, so clinicaltrials.gov is one of the best sites. There you see the most of the studies should be listed there nowadays if they are approved by an RB board and then you can really have a look. If this is of interest of you, you can really apply for the studies and, and ask if you could really be part of this. And of course, here's just a glimpse for, for Pompe disease. Uh, presently, there are uh, five, uh, 105 studies listed. Some of them are without drugs, some of them are including drugs, and some of them are safety studies. Uh, you see here a lot of things listed, and you will hear about some of them later this conference, so therefore I go don't go here in details. So that's the standard of things, but let's go to the next step. So the second part of my thing is something completely different. It's just food for thoughts. 
It's, it's really something what's happened here. Have you ever been to the Frankfurt Airport? You know this one. So you're getting completely confused. So where to go for your next flight? And that's the situation sometimes you have for rare disease. But, but anyhow, um, we have general challenges. We have knowledge base for rare disease. We have clinical and scientific peer groups, uh, key opinion leaders, study group setups. We have pre-study challenges. We have study-related challenges. So, so a lot of things are behind the screen here. And the first thing we have to keep in mind, so what is rare? There are a lot of differences in rare. And if you look at this, so if you want to find your disease in that, you have to have to have a knowledge on this. So, so what is really behind that? And if you want to describe a type of orchid, so also there you need to have a precise knowledge on it. And rare still stays in that phase of uh, to be one of these 3,000. So, so that is really the setting you, you have. And up to 50% of the people affected by rare disease are children, I think. That's something we have also to keep in mind. That's something we don't care. And pumper disease, of course, is a shift. We learned this this morning very well, that we have a shift of more than 80% on the adult side. But still, we have these juvenile early onset patients. So they cover something about 20%. We have to take care about them. And this is responsible, all these groups, for many of the deaths. And that's something we know pretty well as a pumper community, of course. And the prevalence is skewed of this. This is also something very important to keep in mind. And about 90% don't have a single approved drug still. So that's still true. So, so we are in a better situation than in the others. And we had this, this orphan drug that I told you about this. So this was something that was really helpful and still is ongoing to be helpful for us. And only 6% are made on genetic and rare disease information are referred to an undiagnosed disease. Also, this is something important to keep in mind. So there are a lot of, of challenges. And the experts. So Nina made a comment this morning, and she's completely right. The experts you see here in the room are still the experts. They were here five years, eight years, 10 years ago. So we are aged, and we have to bring in our next generation as well, new thoughts as well. I think that's very uh, important. And we still, with all this knowledge based on pumper disease, our understanding of the natural history or cause of the disease is still limited. So we still need all you patients. We need all your information you can give us. And that's an interplay. So that is really a dialogue. And we're still in this dialogue. And I think that's very important. And of course, there's always the discussion with the lack of biomaterial of modern autoptic data sets and things like that. So we're all missing that. That's only doable, in, in my eyes, if we do a sandwich method. So we have to do the scientific base. That's our part. But we need you of course, to, to understand and support us if we have questions, if we have clinical trials. And that will all come again with all the new trials we are facing. There will be still the discussion. There will be muscle biopsies again and things like that. So therefore, this is important. Um, and of course, then we have, we have to cover this better. And of course, there are still only a few scientists and still they are fragmented. They still don't stick really completely together. Uh, in all the models. Also, the setting here in pumper disease is already rather good. But, but anyhow, I think we can improve that. And the knockout mice, I think that is uh, one of the big troubles we still have here for pumper disease. It's the most used animal model, of course, but all mice are being identical. So it's a very homogeneous uh, disease and progression we see here. And this is a complete mismatch to the situations we have in humans. So that's also something we have to keep in mind. So in the beginning, so there was experts on the knowledge on the phenotype. There was the early description of the disease. There was the uh, very severe phenotype. And of course, only a few descriptions till the 1990s. So that was the, the very early phase. And we have some icons who changed that really here in the room, the three sitting here in front of us. Um, and the, rather, the adult phenotype was completely undescribed. So there was hardly any good information we had on that. And also the multisystemic involvement in beyond the infants was hardly unknown. So we had different names. You remember that. So 
you have still the acid maltosis deficiency in the name of your group, uh, and we changed that. And of course, then there was the, the move step forward to to Pombo disease in a way. And if you look at the pathogenesis, of course, there were the morphological descriptions early in the 60s, biochemical analysis in the 70s, and then the genetic uh, period started in the 90s. And Arnold was really one of the key items, persons to, do, to uh, go for this and really developing things on that. It's a very important one. So it was also the fact at uh, that period that also n very few places were kept able to perform the full genetic analysis. And we are lucky that we still have the Rotterdam registry for, for the gene mutations and that they still continue to do that very nice work. Um, and the awareness were completely low. So this was something we faced. So we were untreatable, undiagnosed. And that's a situation that very frequent happened for rare diseases. So no patients, we are unclear, so where are good centers, where to find them. We haven't right uh, numbers on incidences and prevalences. So this all was rare, it was rare. So, so how to change that? And there was the, the unawareness of the multisystemic involvement uh, very much and the heterogeneity, so I, I repeat that again. And the next slide will show you the differences. So that's the publication rate starting in the 60s to the year um, here, uh, 2015. And what was the step up here? So what happened in between here? The step up was just the introduction of the treatment. It was the approval of ERT. That really changed the situation. The changer was having a treatment, everything that was rare, that was undescribed, came alive. So the group worked together, the knowledge base increased, and that was the, the major uh, change we had. So. We need to increase still the knowledge base, so therefore we have to describe the spectrum in a better way. We have to have a better disease awareness, so we are still not really perfect in that. And definitely we need competitors, that's important, and so therefore it's good to have more companies coming in, uh, getting interested here. We still need uh, to uh, involve more clinical specialists to that, and we still need to improve our knowledge on additional pattern mechanisms, and the consequences is really that we have to open our focus again, and that's something we definitely need for the next phase of the clinical studies, and therefore it's still the, the definitely need to have an enhancement of early involvement of all types. You heard about this, the natural history still we have to build up a bit more, and there's another big topic. We are still um, going for the outcome measures we use now for many, many years. Also, we have a lot of experience with them, but we still think they are perhaps not the best. So therefore, we have to, to face this as well. So there's the atypical age of onset, atypical presentations. We have some symptomatic patients and presentations. So how to deal with them? That's all what we need in the thing. And we have still some diagnostic challenges, and it's good to have centers like Rotterdam and Duke who really do still work on this, and they're new persons, and you will listen to them tomorrow. They will tell you new things about what to do and what to do better uh, in things like that. And patient registries, that's uh, always ongoing big topic. You all know around the world, uh, I, I don't know how many different type of, of patient registries we have, but we still need them. So, so this is really something we have to improve and do it better and really to go into the next phase of these registries to come up with new items, including modern technology in that as well. And we have some, I finish with that, patient-related issues. So we have still a small number of patients and sometimes in very fragmented study centers. We have still a hurdle of enrollment uh, to enroll fast a lot of patients in our new studies. And uh, we, we need to have an initiation of multiple centers. So the consequence is the validity of our studies is still questionable. We have a high risk not to show the efficacy we'd like to see. And also we see that there are some ethical issues still there running now placebo trials. So that's, that's something else. So we have now a standard treatment for many years that works. It works not perfectly, but it works. So can we still do placebo controlled sty uh, studies? Is that still doable? That's a question we have. And outcome measures, I, I started already uh, with that. Um, so outcome measures is still something we have to think of how to perform this better. 
I'm, I'm in time, I know. <laughs> and the consequence is, is really the validity of our studies. That's something we have to take care about again. And there are industry issues. So we have to train again the centers, but also sometimes industry, what is the best outcome measure for the study. We have to train the study monitors that they really perform in the right way. That's also something you have to do, of course, as industry, but also we have to take care about this. And this becomes a big issue if you just include two or three patients into a clinical trial. The issue you have to deal with is really an administrative burden that is becoming bigger and bigger from study to study. And again, the topic I always raise, is there enough drug available? So, so that is really very important. Otherwise, you will really lose here all what you can do for your clinical trials and study. And finally, on the summary, we need to enhance really what is the clinical meaningful outcome. So what can we do here? And we have to involve the right people. So think big. That's really, we need to be a group of people who work on this and we all should be in one boat. That's the most important. So we need to provide all these different type of data, of information, what we have on this. And I skipped that one, the role of the patient groups, because we have more time on this. They have a voice in it. And you should raise your voice. You should raise your voice for the FDA, for the EMA. What is your need? That is very important that we have the real life outcome really covered what we are doing here. And so finally, that's really the final slide. The yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the time pressure, but it's the final slide. <laughs> and just go for the final stay as one group. I think that is the most important. And now I'm finishing with those slides. Thanks. <laughs>